taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 to 23. I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us when, who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our next Bible reading is Romans chapter 6. Dead to sin, alive to God. What shall we say then? Are we to, to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of his father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will, we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has domain over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not persist your members to sin as instruments for unforgiveness, so unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no domain over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are no, not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you persist if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who are once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now sh uh, ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its ends eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's just pray. Father, Lord, I ask you to help me, Lord, with the, the words I've prepared. Lord, you know, that I would be guided by your spirit, Lord, and give us ears to hear what you want to say to us. 
on this subject, Lord, that we would be uh, able to honour you, able to glorify you uh, through our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask this. Amen. I think this is probably one of the, the hardest sermons to, uh, to start with. We've had uh, a few weeks already on the resurrection, and the last thing I want to do is to repeat what's already been said in previous weeks. That in itself is a challenge. Um, that wouldn't be the first time preachers have repeated, you know, when Paul says finally and finally and finally. But, um, but also, as I've been preparing it, um, to be able to communicate what God wants to say, I find it quite difficult. So you might have to bear with me. But uh, anyway, let's, let's dive into the subject. Just two more Bible readings to look at first. Uh, two short ones. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Know in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Another one from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, as well as for good works. Okay, so since Easter, we've been looking at what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for us. Firstly, why do we believe in it? What does it mean for our future? And today we're looking at what's it mean for today, here and now, how we live. Of course, the resurrection of Jesus is at the heart of the Christian message. The death and resurrection of Jesus are events in history whose importance goes beyond anything that we can imagine. The historic events, and they're recorded as such, and uh, even independent historians, as we've heard, have recorded the fact that these things took place. But they're more, they're more than just mere events in history, aren't they? And their impact has the potential to affect every person alive, because they affect our relationship with God. And they're unprecedented and they're remarkable in human history. All the damage that was done to our relationship with God when Adam sinned in the garden, whether that was a literal event or whether it was something that symbolised the fall of mankind, all that damage has been repaired and restored by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These great theological and doctrinal statements, what do they mean for us in terms of our day-to-day -day experience of life? Of course, as we've been thinking, the, the, the resurrection of Jesus has gives us hope for the future. Death is not an end, rather it's a doorway that opens up to a glorious new life with God. This is an incredible truth. And the images that we have, like a grain of wheat falling into the ground, dying and turning to burst into new life. And as silver is reminding us through a, a caterpillar that morphs into a butterfly through a cocoon, give us some insight into the sort of transformation that is going to take place when we enter that, into that new life. Okay, that's for the future. What does it mean for us today? What does the Bible have to say? The Bible actually has a lot to say on this subject. We're going to scratch the surface today. So, in Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's been writing about the resurrection in very clear words. He's been saying in very strong terms about the hope for the resurrection. And in conclusion to this passage is where he writes about resurrection of the dead, the resurrection body, the mystery that surrounds it, and the victory over death. So in verse 53, he says, For this perishable body must put on imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality, 
When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to apply these truths. And he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. He's got two things, hasn't he? First of all, you've got these great spiritual truths about our mortal bodies passing into immortality, death and defeated. And then it gives instructions on how we're to live, what it means for us today. So what's the link between those two? Why does Paul say this, therefore, that? What's the link he's making between those two? So you've got these great spiritual truths and he morphs it into practical stuff. He tells us to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the Lord's work. So how does that link to resurrection? He tells us that our labour is not in vain. Why is it? Why is our labour not in vain? <clears throat> why is this linked to resurrection? What does he have in mind by the Lord's work he refers to? <clears throat> now, some suggest that when he writes about the Lord's work, he has in mind the work of evangelism and the work of the building up of the body of Christ, the church. The reason why they're not in vain is because of the resurrection. Because the work we do has results that will last forever. And that means in contrast with what happens in the world, isn't it? You know, the, what happens in the world is all very transient stuff, isn't it? People don't, doesn't last, you know. Even the pyramids are going to wear out one day, you know. It's, but what we do in Christ will last forever. We're building for him. I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us an eternal view on the work we do for him and through the church. It's not only for the here and now, it's for eternity. What we do will be measured in the light of eternity. This theme of linking the power of the resurrection on how we live day to day appears in other places. So in Ch Titus chapter 2, he, wrote, he writes about being trained to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. And the reason for that is that we're waiting for the return of our resurrected king. One day our king is going to return and it will be in glory. He is the one who has redeemed us from all lawlessness. And he is the one who is purifying for himself a people for his own possession. People who are zealous for good works. And Christians should live in that way because it's the grace of God that saves us. And that it's also the grace of God instructs us. Those who live... Great, I, you know, let me go back. The grace of God that saves us also instructs us on how to receive God's grace to live in a new way. The way that we learn to live this new way is being trained by grace. These were the, that was the key words that came to in these verses. We're trained by grace. It's an unusual phrase. What does it mean to be trained by grace? Of course, grace is the favour that we have, that we receive from God, that we haven't earned. So what does it mean to be trained by grace? How does grace train us? What do you think the purpose of God is in showing this grace to us? Of course, if I was to ask you what's the purpose of God in showing his grace to us, what would you say? It's a very basic question, isn't it? What's the purpose of God showing his grace to us? 
a good question that, you know, if, uh, if, if you were talking to somebody in the street who was inquiring about Christianity, and they said to you, what's the purpose of God's showing his grace and love to us? That's an interesting thing to do. And of course, it's a bit like, I quote here from the very honourable Shrek and Donkey, it's a bit like the layers on an onion. At one level, it's being forgiven, our sin, but it's more than that. As well as being forgiven, we're also cleansed from our sin. But it's more than that. It's having our consciences cleansed and restored. And when Peter talked about what God's purposes are in revealing his gracious nature to us, this is what Peter writes. He has granted his divine power so, so that all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world through sinful desires. So Peter's talking about the purpose of God in our lives, is so that we can become partakers of divine nature. And when uh, Peter, uh, Paul, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, says that we have the mind of Christ. He says we have the mind of Christ. And maybe some of these things give us some insight into what it means to be taught by grace. That mind of Christ is teaching us. And this purpose of being a partaker of divine nature, it's this God's revealing himself to us and showing us what these things are meaning in practice in our lives. It's grace it is that's teaching us how to say no to sin and yes to godliness. And that is something which applies now, in the here and now, not just, not just in the future. We set our mind on the return of our risen king, don't we? And that view will impel us to live holy lives to honour him. And it's not, of course, it's not that we're no longer able to sin. That would be heresy. But by the grace of his power at work in us, we are able not to sin. Jim's word read to us from the book of Romans, what Paul had to say to the Roman people. And that is continuing this theme of living a godly life. So he read, Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And he goes on to say, The death he died to sin, he died once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. And then Paul goes on to apply that to us. He says, So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And he says that because we have been united with him in a death like his we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, the word united, according to the scholars, is the same word that's used for grafting in. So when a new shoot is being taken, is being grafted in to the stock of an existing plant, it's the word that's being used, it's being united with it. And of course, that's a picture of what God is doing in our lives. In our lives, we've been taken and we've been grafted into the life of the Christ. And of course, that's very similar to the image that Jesus talked to the disciples about in the vine. He says, abide in the vine. You've been grafted into the vine. So that's, I think, again, we can see that means, you can see that life as we're grafted in. We know his life moving through us. And it's that life which is the source of our ability, our enabling. 
It's that life moving through us. It gives fruit for him. It's, and it's not our own strengths and our abilities. It's, it's to do with him. And our own strengths and abilities are just the conduit that God is using to, to, to bring that. I want to ask another question. What do you think, how would you describe what God does in our lives? I've got three words for you. Does he repair? Does he restore? Or does he renew? Repair, restore, or renew? Of course, repair is when you fix something that's broken. And that might mean something to us, and it's in your own life. You might think that there's something that's happened when God has fixed something that was broken. And renovate, obviously, something when you restore something to its original condition. But renew is when you replace something that's broken. So it's something that is completely new. I was picturing a piece of furniture. You can imagine a piece of furniture that's been repaired. You can see the repair. The furniture is still functional and all that, but you can see where it's been fixed. And a restored piece of furniture looks like it was when it was first made, but it's still old. You know, so that's restoration. But what does that mean for what God is doing in our lives? There are times when we know what it is for God to repair us. There's times that maybe a relationship has been broken and we need God to somehow repair that broken relationship. Maybe that resonates with some of us here. But it's God's heart to do more than that. God wants to renew us from the inside out. And I think it's this resurrection life which speaks to us of the renewing power of God in our lives. So what's it mean to be renewed? Hmm. Well, I suppose like many of us here, I can't wait to have my body renewed. Um, that might ring bells with some. Um, I was didn't write this down. I was, I was reading from uh, Romans chapter eight. Um, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, also having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And um, I don't know about you, but the renewal at this moment of time is something that's different from our bodies. I look forward to that day when I'll get a new body and I don't have freaks and groans and, and you know, we won't have macular glaucoma and, and, you know, all these things. You know, you, so what does renewal mean then? What does renewal mean in our lives? The Bible talks about us becoming new creatures or new creations in Christ. Jesus taught in Nicodemus, I'm sure many of us are very familiar, what word did he use? You must be born again. So if I was to ask you, what do you think it means to be renewed? What would you say? How would you answer that question? It's clear something that happens on the inside of us. And I don't mean all those hidden organs of our body, our heart and our liver and our pancreas and all those things, is it? And it's about being alive to God. So that we can know God, have a relationship with him know him as father. Yes, there might be times when in our lives when God needs to repair damage that's been done. Maybe there's restoration needed perhaps. Maybe there's, there's a phrase in the, the years that the locust has eaten. So maybe there's restoration sometimes needed for that. So God does want to come along and repair and restore. 
But I think also in the resurrection of Christ, we know that just as he had that new resurrection body, we would know ourselves that inside we know that renewing of God's Holy Spirit. About being born again of God's Holy Spirit. So your spirit is now alive to God. And it's a radical change. I know when I look back to when I first became a Christian, I discovered that peace with God that flooded over me. I discovered I had a purpose. I discovered there was meaning in my life. That God was relevant to me. And it gets off the stage now. I actually can't think. Because I've been a Christian for so long, I can't think back to what it was like before I was a Christian. I couldn't, I couldn't describe to you, but just to know that at that time I knew the change, this revolution that God had brought about in my life. And that inside there was something there that was different, something that was alive to God that knew him. And I trust that you can say that, you know, that you can look back to a time when, yes, this is what God did in my life. That you can say, I know that I've got peace with him. He's my father. And the resurrection of Jesus actually takes us beyond his teachings. Some of us, some people see Jesus as being a great teacher. But if you see Jesus as a teacher, his teachings can be very frustrating, can't they? Um, it's not easy to love your enemy. It's, it, it can be quite difficult to forgive people. But the teachings on their own can be a bit of a <clears throat> anchor that drags you back, saying, I can't do that. I, I can't meet that standard, God. It's too much for me. It's too heavy for me. So where do we look, Francis, then? Whether it's a personal level or it's a church or for society as a whole. When David wrote about this in Psalm 121, he says, to the eye, I lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. His help wasn't in the hills. He was looking to Jerusalem. What was in Jerusalem? It was the temple of the living God. Well, it wasn't the temple. It was the tabernacle in David's time, wasn't it? But he knew that was where God dwelt. And when he wanted to know where to go for help, he lifted his eyes to the place where God was. Now he turned to God for his help. And that symbolized the place where God was for him. And what is that equivalent for us? I think the resurrection of Jesus, we look to that resurrection of Jesus Christ and say, I will look to God for my help. What seemed to be a hopeless situation, God was able to turn it round and bring honor and glory and power through this dreadful situation. And that new life of Christ came forth. So this is something we can depend on. We can be people who turn to God to find our answers. I've been reading another angle on this. I've been reading the book of Ezekiel in my own personal Bible readings. And Ezekiel gives us a different perspective. Ezekiel is written after the children of Israel have been taken into Babylon. Excuse me. And, uh, and Ezekiel is giving words about what is going to happen as the people are taken back to their land of promise back to the way, place where they've been exiled from and what's God's purpose in doing this restoration what, what God shows to Ezekiel in chapter 36 is he says it is not for your sake that I'm about to act but for the sake of my holy name I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. The nations will know that I am the Lord. His purpose of what God was doing was to restore God's glory before people who had spurned it. Uh, the people who had returned to the land, it, the land had been overrun. They had to rebuild the nation, they had to rebuild the temple. And God, I think God is shown to the world through the resurrection that he is acting for his holy name. 
He wants to achieve his purpose so that he will be honoured and glorified through us in our world. Just same as he was saying to Ezekiel, through your returning, I want to restore my holy name. This is our calling. Carol read to us earlier from the book of Ephesians, and the, the words in Ephesians I just find are absolutely amazing. That we might know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, when he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. I find those words when you see, he says, do you want to know where to sit, where to look for what God's power means in your life? He says, look to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the power of God that's at work in your life. That's what he's saying. So if you want to know what the power of God is, what it means in your life, where do you look? Look at resurrection. So Christ committed himself into the Father's hands when he died on that cross. And it was by the Father's power that he rose from the dead. That same power is at work in us. And how is that revealed? Through our holy lives. And as I think about this, this is my closing bit. And I, 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 please, forget if it's a bit torturous, then please bear with me. But I, I really find these, these truths are quite difficult to express. Um, what I wanted to do is put this into an eternal context. We know that when we look at the death of Jesus, that is anticipated in so many places in the Bible. You can see the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. You see the Passover Lamb. And all through the Old Testament, it's anticipating the coming of this Christ and purpose of God. And what God has been doing is he's been making a way back for mankind. And ever since the fall of man, God has been working out his purpose to recreate that pathway back so that mankind could have a relationship with him. He wants to create that pathway so that we can repent and return. And his plan and his purpose for us are clear in this. He wants us to be part of his grand plan. And the resurrection, I don't want to sound petty on this, but I don't say the resurrection isn't a bolt on to the crucifixion. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ together are the answer to our situation. It's through the, re through the death of Christ that we know our sins forgiven. And it's through the resurrection of Christ that we know that new life, we know that new entry. And the two are connected. The two are so part of what we're doing. You know, we have to know what it is to be crucified with Christ to know the mystery of his death worked in us. And we have to know also that, uh, that rising up in the new life in Christ, because God wants to restore us to that place. His heart is to restore us to that place that he, was, that he started from. And some people say that when you read the Bible, you've got like Genesis and you've got the back end of Revelation. The back end of Revelation, you're back to... It's not a garden, it's a city. But it's a place, the city, where God dwells with his people. At the start, you had a garden where God dwelt with Adam and Eve. And what happens between the two is like, these are like bookends. And everything's directing now towards that place in Revelation, where we will be with the Father in that new Jerusalem place. But it's part of what is here and now. We can be part of this process that God is working at. We can recognise what God's heart is for us, that he wants us to be in fellowship with him. He wants us to be in relationship with him. The same as Adam walked with God in the cool of the garden. And that was something that was so precious and so special. And in the midst of everything that's going on around us, all this temporal stuff that we're part of in this daily life, we are above and beyond all that. This is our relationship with God the Father, which underpins everything, which is the constant in our lives. It's the eternal thing in our lives. It's what matters in the light of eternity. 
yes, we, we, have, we, we do everything in our lives that we have to do, but we've got a bigger destiny, we've got a bigger purpose. And I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the doorway that God gives us into this entry into new life. I hope that's meant something. I'm, I, I do apologise, it's a bit garbled, but um, may the Lord take that and perhaps allow him to teach us what he, uh, what he wants to from. Anyway, I'll hand back to the musicians. Thank you.